parliamentary sittings and committee meetings. You can rewind, pause or go to a specific contribution whenever you want from your home, office or on the go. Log on now to Paulview at paulview.ttparliament.org. Vice President. Let us pray. Almighty God, we, will, we willingly acknowledge you as the supreme being, most gracious and most merciful. Look down, we beseech you, on us who are members of this Senate, and deign to assist us in the duties that we have to perform on behalf of our beloved country of Trinidad and Tobago. Open our eyes to see the truth and help us to accept it with all its implications into our lives. Direct us, O Lord, in our, in our deliberation so that setting aside private interests, unwholesome prejudices, and personal affections, we may treat all matters set before us with honesty, courage, and conviction. Through all we say and do in this Senate, May we give glory and honor to your holy name, inspire confidence in our fellow citizens, and make a positive contribution to the peace and prosperity of our nation. Amen. Announcements by the President. Honorable Senators, I wish to advise that the President of the Senate, Senator the Honorable Christine Kangaloo, is currently acting as President of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. <coughs> Honorable Senators, I have granted leave of absence to Senator the Honorable Dennis Moses, Senator Daniel Duki, Senator Saddam Hussein, and to Senator Melissa Ramkisun, all of, all of whom are out of the country. I have also granted leave of absence to Senator Torrell Shrikisun, who is ill. Honorable Senators, I have received the following correspondence from Her Excellency, the Acting President, Christine Kangalo. The Constitution of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. <clears throat> By... Constitution of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. 
by His Excellency Anthony Thomas Aquinas Carmona, ORTTSC, and Her Excellency, the Honorable Christine Kangaloo, President of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago and Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces and Acting President of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago and Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces, Anthony Thomas Aquinas Carmona, ORTTSC, President, to Ms. Ayana Liba Lewis, whereas Senator Daniel Duque is incapable of performing his duties as a senator by reason of his absence from Trinidad and Tobago, now therefore I, Anthony Thomas Aquinas Carmona, President has aforesaid in exercise of the power vested in me by Section 441A and Section 44A of the Constitution of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, do hereby appoint you, Ayana Lieber Lewis, to be temporarily a member of the Senate with effect from the 16th of January 2018 and continuing during the absence from Trinidad and Tobago of the said Senator Daniel Duque given under my hand and the seal of the President of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago at the Office of the President St. Anne's this 12th day of January 2018. To Mr. Endali Young, whereas Senator Dennis Moses is incapable of performing his duties as a senator by reason of his absence from Trinidad and Tobago, now therefore I, Christine Kangaloo, acting president as aforesaid, in exercise of the power vested in me by Section 441A and Section 44A of the Constitution of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, do hereby appoint you, Endali Young, to be temporarily a member of the Senate with effect from the 16th of January 2018 and continuing during the absence from Trinidad and Tobago of the said Senator Dennis Moses, given under my hand and the seal of the President of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago at the Office of the President St. Anne's this 15th day of January 2018. To Mr. Brian B. Whereas Senator Saddam Hussein is incapable of performing his duties as a senator by reason of his absence from Trinidad and Tobago, now therefore I, Christine Kangaloo, acting president as aforesaid in exercise of the power vested in me by Section 441A and Section 444B of the Constitution of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, acting in accordance with the advice of the Leader of the Opposition, do hereby appoint you, Brian Big, to be temporarily a member of the Senate with effect from the 16th of January 2018 and continuing during the absence from Trinidad and Tobago of the said Senator Saddam Hussein given under my hand and the seal of the President of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago at the Office of the President St. Anne's this 15th day of January 2018. To Mr. Albert William Sidney, whereas Senator Torrell Shrikisun is incapable of performing his duties as a senator by reason of illness, now therefore I, Christine Kangaloo, acting president as aforesaid, in exercise of the power vested in me by Section 441B, and Section 444C of the Constitution of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago do hereby appoint you, Albert William Sidney, to be temporarily a member of the Senate with effect from the 16th of January 2018 and continuing during the absence of Senator Torrell Shrikisun by reason of illness, given under my hand and the seal of the President of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago at the Office of the President St. Anne's this 15th day of January 2018. To Mr. John Heath, whereas Senator Melissa Ramkisun is incapable of performing her duties as a senator by reason of her absence from Trinidad and Tobago, now therefore I, Christine Kangaloo, acting president as aforesaid, in exercise of the power vested in me by Section 441A and Section 444C of the Constitution of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, do hereby appoint you, John Heath, to be temporarily a member of the Senate with effect from the 16th of January 2018 and continuing during the absence from Trinidad and Tobago of the said Senator Melissa Ramkisun, given under my hand and the seal of the President of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago at the Office of the President St. Anne's this 15th day of January 2018. Honorable Senators, Senators are required to take the oath. I, Ayanna Lewis, having been appointed a member of parliament 
do swear by Almighty God that I will bear true faith and allegiance to Trinidad and Tobago, will uphold the Constitution and the law, and will conscientiously and impartially discharge the responsibilities to the people of Trinidad and Tobago upon which I'm about to enter. <coughs> I and Elder Young, having been appointed a member of parliament, do <coughs> solemnly affirm <coughs> that I will bear true faith and allegiance to Trinidad and Tobago, will uphold the constitution and the law, and will conscientiously and impartially discharge the responsibilities of the people of Trinidad and Tobago upon which I am about to enter. I, Brian Big, having been appointed a member of parliament, do swear by Almighty God that I will bear true faith and allegiance to Trinidad and Tobago, will uphold the constitution and the law, and will conscientiously and impartially discharge the responsibility to the people of Trinidad and Tobago upon which I am about to enter. I, John Heath, having been appointed a member of Parliament, do swear by Almighty God that I will bear true faith and allegiance to Trinidad and Tobago, will uphold the Constitution and the law, and will conscientiously and impartially discharge the responsibilities to the people of Trinidad and Tobago upon which I am about to enter. I, Albert Sidney, having been appointed a member of parliament, do swear by Almighty God that I will bear true faith and allegiance to Trinidad and Tobago, will uphold the constitution and the law, and will conscientiously and impartially discharge the responsibilities to the people of Trinidad and Tobago <coughs> upon which I am about to enter.
Honorable Senators, I'm just awaiting further correspondence in relation to uh, the last temporary senator. Once I receive that correspondence, I will seek your leave to revert to that item on the order paper. <clears throat> Honorable Senators, as you are aware, <clears throat> Professor George Maxwell Richards, former President of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, passed away on Monday, January the 8th, 2018. I now invite you to offer tributes. <coughs> thank you very much, Mr. Vice President. And Mr. Vice President, I thank you for giving me the opportunity to pay tribute to our fourth and distinguished President of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, and, in and in indeed, a most distinguished son of the soil. <coughs> Professor George Maxwell Richards, TC, CMT, and PhD, passed away peacefully on January 8, 2018. He was 86 years old. His body lay in state in the parliamentary entrance yesterday, where all parliamentarians had the opportunity to play their last respects, as well as members of the general public. <clears throat> Professor Richards' life in my opinion, can be easily categorized into four main domains. Firstly, Professor Richards, a scholar and academic. Secondly, <clears throat> Professor Richards, the president. Thirdly, Professor Richards, the intense family man. And fourthly, but by no means least, and I'll take the liberty here to call him Max, the quintessential Trinbegonian. Love of the culture, <clears throat> the arts, an enjoyable time among friends, and has been now known enjoying life to the max. <clears throat> Let me first deal with Professor Richards, the academic and the scholar. <clears throat> he attained his secondary education at Queen's Royal College in the 1940s. He became a staff trainee in 1950-51 with what is called UBOTS, or the United British Oil Fields of Trinidad and Tobago, <clears throat> which later became Shell Trinidad. And Mr. Vice President, let me tell you, to be a staff trainee in the 50s as a man of color was a tremendous accomplishment. He held managerial positions at Shell from 1957 to 65, along with another distinguished son of the soil, Professor Ken Julian. <coughs> he then entered academia as a senior lecturer in chemical engineering and worked his way up the academic ladder, so to speak, <coughs> to become professor of chemical engineering, deputy principal, and principal and poor vice chancellor from 1985 to 1986. At the professional level, <coughs> he served on the boards inter alia of Trintoc the National Gas Company, and Chairman of the Institute of Marine Affairs. He also has been a member and served in very, very distinguished professional so societies and bodies, <clears throat> including the Association of Professional Engineers, the Institute of Chemical Engineers of London, the Institute of Petroleum of London, among many others. Mr. Vice President, an, uh, an academic and scholar par excellence one of a kind. <coughs> Let me now deal with Professor Richards, the fourth president of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. Mr. Vice President, Professor Richards served for two terms, from 2003 to 2013, as this country's fourth president, the only one to date without a legal background. In spite of that, he clearly understood his role as president and carried it out with clarity and decorum, and obviously sought legal advice when he required it. <clears throat> the outstanding attribute of his tenure was his ability to have amicable and productive relationships with the executive, with the opposition, with the parliament, and with all stakeholders in Trinidad and Tobago. <clears throat> and probably more importantly, 
he served as Commander-in-Chief with distinction. And in my opinion, the most important role as a president, Minister of National Security. And then we have Professor Richards, the family man. Mr. Vice President, it is common knowledge that he was a dedicated family man. Today he leaves to mourn <clears throat> his loving and loyal wife, Dr. Jean J Ram John Richards, his son Mark, and his daughter, whom I know quite well, and I know she loved him dearly. And finally, <clears throat> Mr. Vice President, Max the quintessential Trinbegunian. Max loved his simple life. He loved his culture. He loved his fellow citizens. He loved the common man. This common knowledge that he loved carnival. He loved the carnival fets and was virtually single-handedly responsible for making the UWI fet into the premium carnival occasion for many, many years. And later, friends to the max, a must-go-to carnival occasion. <clears throat> Mr. Vice President, so therefore in closing this tribute, I want to say that if there was ever a well-rounded personality, it was George Maxwell Richards. If there was ever a patriot in this country, it was George Maxwell Richards. If there was ever a plain and simple good man, it was George Maxwell Richards. And may I add, in Trinidad and Tobago today, we need more good men and more good women. So on behalf of the government of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, on behalf of the members on this side of the Senate, and I show I speak for all members in this chamber, on behalf of the party that I chair, the People's National Movement, we would like to offer our deepest condolences to his family, friends, and close associates, and to let them know that he has lived a good life. He has served his country well. May his soul rest in eternal peace. Leader of Opposition Business. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Mr. Vice President, it is with a heavy heart and a profound sense of shock and awe that I rise to speak on behalf of the members of this side of the House to pay a tribute to a fallen star and the loss of a true patriot. The late Professor George Maxwell Richard was a man of multifaceted dimensions whose life from the cradle to the grave epitomized what is meant to be a true trini, a trini to the bone, with the marrow included. Mr. Vice President, it is fashionable in our country these days to speak of distinguished personalities in a very banal and superficial manner. It therefore behoves me to tarry a little on the life and achievements of the fourth president of our republic. Our late president was, in, was born in San Fernando on the 1st of December 1931. And with most of our citizens at the time, he attended elementary school. However, most of the young citizens and brilliant minds of the day, under a brutally discriminating social and economic colonial system. The young Richards won one of the few scholarships available, which enabled him to attend Queen's Royal College, 
one of the few preeminent institutions of secondary education at the time. In record time, and with the speed and strength of a Usain Bolt, he ascended to the pinnacle of academic and intellectual illuminance. He attended Manchester and Oxford universities in the United Kingdom, where his academic prowess shone forth like a beacon. On his return to Trinidad from studies abroad, he worked in the petroleum industry from 1950 to 1965, before leaving to pursue a career in academia. He joined the staff or the academic staff at the Faculty of Engineering, where he became the head of the Department of Chemical Engineering and later Dean of the Faculty of Engineering. He was a pioneer in building the Department of Chemical Engineering and piloted the international recognition of that department to the benefit of not only Trinidad and Tobago, but to the wider international community. He progressed from academia to administration and with a meteoric speed rose to become deputy principal, acting principal, pro-vice chancellor, and ultimately principal of the university. He made a sterling contribution both to the faculty of engineering and to the university as a whole. He was also chancellor of the University of Trinidad and Tobago. Mr. Vice President, his capacity and capability were not only demonstrated in the spheres of academia and the petroleum industry, but equally in the service of the public and private sectors. He was a member of many boards and professional bodies. In the sphere of engineering, he was a member of many associations, the most notable being the Association of Professional Engineers of Trinidad and Tobago, the Institute of Chemical Engineering of London, the Institute of Petroleum in London, and the Royal Society of Chemistry. In many respects, he was Trinidad and Tobago writ large. In the sphere of genealogy and sociocultural association and assimilation, he was the epitome rather, of a true, true trini. If one should echo the sentiments of one of our Calypsonians, a trini to the bone, as I said. Mr. Vice President, he was a man of many and diverse parts. And if I should quote the distinguished Nigerian parliamentarian, the legendary Kingsley Mbawi, he was a man of timber and caliber. Mr. Vice President, what evidence can I adduce to substantiate such an assertion? There are many, but I'll only give a few examples. He was the only one of our presidents to date whose DNA harbors Amerindian and Chinese ancestry. Let's strike one for our first people. The jury is still out, however, as to whether he was of Carib or Arawak ancestry, or a mixture of both. But you know, Mr. Vice President, he reflected our multicultural 
society, our multi-ethnic society. He was a mass enthusiast. He loved carnival and the arts. He played mass every year. And under his tenure, as my colleague said, the annual ritual of the UWI Carnival Fete attained unprecedented heights of excellence. It was one of the rites of passage to carnival. If you did not make the UWI Carnival Fete, you would have been considered as having missed the pre-carnival boat. It was the gold standard of all such fetes, almost the mother of all carnival celebrations. He was an ardent advocate and supporter of the advancement of women. He was a flag bearer for a woman president within three months of his passing his wishes will be fulfilled. He received several national awards and international citations. He served two terms as president from 2003 to 2013. And to date, as my colleague said, the only head of state who was not a member of the legal profession. He liberated us, if only briefly, from the entrapment of having only lawyers as presidents. <laughs> oh, what a difference he made and it made. His passion for critical thinking, precision in the use of language, as reflected in his erudite addresses to the nation and his general love for life will be sorely missed and long be remembered. Indeed, Mr. Vice President, it can truly be said he was a man of a golden age. I am confident, Mr. President, that Professor Max Richards will be sorely missed. In fact, I dare say that anyone could dispute that his lifetime approximated to not only the age of what is called the Vedic, but also the era of the Confucian. Mr. Vice President, in closing, let me pay respect to members of his family, and particularly to the person who stood solidly at his side since that glorious wedding day, his wife, Jean Richards. Now the creator who put them together in his infinite wisdom saw it was time to call him home to that graceful and beautiful place for his well-deserved and eternal rest. May his devoted spouse and children summon the fortitude and spiritual strength to sustain his loss and to enable them to continue walking in the presence of, of, of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father. Mr. Vice President, May the Lord make peace with the soul of our departed brother and let perpetual light shine upon him. May he rest in peace. Senator Small. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice President, for allowing me the opportunity to join in with our colleagues here and pay in tribute to the passing of Professor George Maxwell Richards. Husband, parent, engineer, teacher, director, chairman, professor, president. These were just some of the rules and titles ascribed 
to, to the name George Maxwell Richards. As noted by my colleague earlier, he would have been born on the 1st of December 1931, and he was from a family comprising of two boys and three girls. We are told that his favorite foods included cow heel soup, pilau, and curry, a real Trini man. As noted earlier also, Professor Richards was the first president to not have a legal background. When he was asked about, about that, whether or not he was surprised in 2003 to be put forward for the presidency, given his lack of legal training, he said his training as a chemical engineer set the stage for his future life and opened endless possibilities. On February 11, 2008, Professor George Maxwell Richards was elected unopposed to serve a second term as this country's president. In an interview he gave just shortly after his inauguration, he indicated that among his top concerns was the problem of crime. And I quote, unfortunately, life has become very cheap, as he reflected on the killing of a 16-year-old school schoolboy that same week. He went on to say, Mr. Vice President, that it takes a village to raise a child. And to some extent, the present generation of young people do not seem to have social support. He went on to also say that Trinidad and Tobago is in need of a social intervention. The social, the solution he indicated, is involves getting guns and drugs off the streets. And most notably, he also indicated that he would support any call for more female leaders, and in particular, a female president. Mr. Vice President, the parallels of his comments almost 10 years ago with current events is indeed striking. Professor George Maxwell Richards was generous, ready to share his learning with others and allowing others to benefit from his calm judgment and accurate reasoning. His was a fertile mind, always planning positive ventures for this country that he loved so much. Professor Richards was also a man who did not let the trappings of his office stymie his love for life and the culture of our blessed country. Most of us call it now work-life balance. A lot of us struggle with that. Professor Richards has left us with memories of, a distinguished, of distinguished career achievements by a man dedicated to lifelong learning. He was endowed by God with a mind of exceptional keenness, the heart of a giant, and an administrative ability and drive to see things through to fruition. Professor Richards was loved for what he represented, a determination to succeed against the odds, humility, an innate sense of fair play, and a tremendous sense of service to the community, as evidenced by his role as patron to many good causes. Mr. Vice President, it is truly unfortunate that greatness and other such adjectives are often only ascribed posthumously when the full impact of a person's life achievements are fully germinated and born fruit. Paraphrasing from the author Zig Ziglar, it is my humble retort that the life of Professor Richards was designed for accomplishment, engineered for success, and endowed with the seeds of greatness. To the family of Professor George Maxwell Richards, we on the independent bench join with you and the national community in mourning his passing. George Maxwell Richards had an infectious and indomitable spirit and love for life. This spirit touched virtually everyone who, came, who he came into contact with. There's a saying that everybody dies, but not everybody lives. Well, we're all here to pay tribute to a man whose life was well and truly lived. We're in some ways friends of the Max, and today we pay to our dear departed leader a rousing tribute to the Max. To his family, may Almighty God pour on you a balm of peace, comfort, and healing. As we have been assured that neither death nor life, nor angels nor demons, nor things present nor things to come, nor height nor depth can separate, can separate us from God's love. Today we all mourn with the entire Richards family, knowing that their loss is personal and profound, and valuing their willingness to allow us to share in a farewell to Max. We also mourn as a nation because we know we are saying goodbye to a true patriot. 
as he sits aloft upon the wings of the angels, the dear departed soul of George Maxwell Richards is looking upon us and exhorting us to comfort his family and all those who mourn his passing. Professor Richards has gone home now, leaving those of us who grieve his passing with loving and nurturing memories of the good that he did for his family and our, and our blessed nation. Professor Richards, you'll be missed. Your name is carved in our hearts, and your legacy is etched in our minds. Mr. Vice President, on behalf of my colleagues on the, on the independent bench, I extend deepest condolences to the Richards family and his passing. May God bless Professor George Maxwell Richards, and may he rest in eternal peace. Honorable Senators, I join with you in offering my deepest condolences to the family of Professor George Maxwell Richards, former President of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. I have noted since his passing on Monday, the 8th of January, 2018, the many tributes from members of Parliament, his many colleagues, and members of the public in his honor. It is by divine law that we cannot take anything from this world when we leave it behind. However, by the impact we have on others, we can add to it. By all accounts, through his service to students, colleagues, and the wider community as a former professor emeritus in chemical engineering and a former principal of the St. Augustine campus of the University of West Indies, through his unwavering support of and contribution to culture, through his service to country on various state boards, through his service to an entire generation as the fourth president of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, through his life as one of our sons, one of our brothers, one of our fathers, and one of our servants, we as a people gained a shining beacon, an example of citizenship, statesmanship, and leadership. His service to others was surely the emulation of the words service above self, as he served this nation selflessly in various capacities for some 60 years. The impact of his philanthropy is well known, deeply appreciated, and continues to ensure the development of youth at the tertiary level. As I reflect on his life and take note of the various contributions and accolades, I am reminded of the quote, in reading of the lives of great men, I found that the first victory they won was over themselves. Self-discipline with all of them came first. Indeed, for anyone to have made or make such a stellar contribution to any nation, discipline is required. As a president, he was tolerant, and as a leader, he inspired production. Today, as we remember the man as a servant of the people, let us not forget that he was also a husband and a father. To his family, I say on behalf of a country, thank you for understanding. Thank you for sharing. Today, we mourn with you as a nation. Tomorrow, we say our farewells as an extended family. May you find comfort, solace, and peace in the knowledge that he served us well. He was well loved by all and that he rests in eternal peace. Honorable Senators, we will now observe a minute of silence. <clears throat> Honorable Senators, I instruct the clerk to convey to his family the sentiments expressed today. Honorable Senators, as you are aware, former Senator Donna Carter passed away on Tuesday, January 2nd, 2018. I now invite you to offer tributes. Honorable Leader of Government Business. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice President. 
Mr. Vice President, Mrs. Donna Carter Hunt, former government senator, <coughs> died peacefully on Tuesday, the 2nd of January, 2018, at a home, or should I say her adopted home in Costa Rica. <coughs> her funeral mass was held on Wednesday, the 3rd of January, 2018, at Hardines de Recuerdo Heredia, that's in Costa Rica. <clears throat> After her cremation, her ashes will be brought to Trinidad for final burial. <clears throat> Mr. Vice President, Donna Carter and I were very close colleagues. Incidentally, we both entered politics at the same time. <clears throat> she contested in 2000 the St. Joseph seat. I contested for the first time in 2000, the Ottawa Mayaro seat. And we also had one thing in common. Both of us lost in 2000. <clears throat> she lost the St. Joseph seat. I lost the Mayaro seat. But as fate would have it, I got another chance. And as fate would have it, for reasons still unknown, she didn't get the opportunity <coughs> to contest St. Joseph again. But having lost <coughs> the election in 2000, that was a unique period in the history of Trinidad and Tobago politics, <coughs> because we had three elections back to back. In 2001, because of convulsions in the UNC at the time, where the government collapsed, <coughs> the 2001 election, saw so the famous 1818 deadlock. In 2002, obviously the, there was no speaker, so we could have only governed through the cabinet <coughs> for approximately one year. So in 2002, I would say it was the mother of all elections. <coughs> and my claim to fame personally is that myself and the mother of our distinguished attorney general, Mrs. Diane Sukaran, I winning in Ottawa Mayaro, and she winning in San Fernando West. We broke that deadlock <coughs> and put the PNM solidly into government. At that point in time, <coughs> during the 2001-18-18, December 20, 28, 2001 to October 9, 2002, <clears throat> Ms. Donna Carter was appointed a government senator and she became minister in the office of the prime minister with responsibility <clears throat> for e ecclesiastic affairs. After the 1818 deadlock was broken, a short while after that, she was offered an ambassadorial appointment to South Africa. Her appointment was on the 11th of November 2003. She actually assumed duty on the 26th of April 2004, and she demitted office <coughs> on the 30th of April 2008. And she had unique stories to tell Mr. Vice President because South Africa was in the early stages of its post-apartheid period. And during that period, there were a lot of convulsions in South Africa. They were trying to settle into this new society. <clears throat> and she had some wonderful experiences to tell about the caliber of a distinguished international statesman, a man called Nelson Mandela. And she saw South Africa go from a very divided society to one that is uniting for the betterment of all as the days go by. <clears throat> South Africa still has its challenges, but it continues to be a model on the African continent as to how you can very, very maturely foster the cause of development for the, benefit, for the benefits of all. It's called a rainbow country, just like Trinidad. And despite 
its historical challenges. I think South Africa is fast overcoming a lot of these. So it is in that context, <clears throat> I remember Donna. She decided to spend the latter part of her life in Costa Rica. Um, I never questioned her as to why, but that is her choice. But for the short period that she served this country, she served it with distinction. Mr. Vice President, through you, I offer condolences to her husband and her immediate family, and may her soul rest in peace. Senator Amin. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Mr. Vice President, I rise to pay tribute to a former member of this Senate, Mrs. Donna Carter Hunt, who served in the Seventh Republican Parliament from the period the 5th of April 2002 to the 28th of August 2002. She was born in March of 1945 and she was married to Mr. John Hunt. Her professional career included before coming into the field of politics being a teacher at the El Dorado Senior Comprehensive School. Um, she did contest the St. Joseph seat, Mr. Um, Vice President, and I recall that election because that was the year I was just getting involved in politics on the East West Corridor. Um, and she was defeated by Mr. Carlos John, who went on to become a minister. And uh, shortly after, there was a change in government. And uh, she was appointed, even though she didn't contest in that particular election, she was appointed as a government senator and uh, in the minister, in the office of the prime minister with the responsibility for ecclesiastic affairs. She was appointed in the, um, she was appointed as High Commissioner to South Africa in November of 2003, but it wasn't until I think about 2005 she was able to pick up her, that appointment due to illness. And at that time, the External Affairs Chief of Protocol, Mr. Carl Francis, was sent to South Africa to act as an envoy in her place. And when she did eventually assume duties, um, again in 2007 she fell ill and had to, re to go to Costa Rica for medical treatment. She eventually demitted office in April of 2008. And Mr. Vice President, um, that to me is um, you know, one of the indications of the challenges of public office. Even though her time in the Senate may have been short, even though she would have offered to give of herself a public service to Trinidad and Tobago. Our own personal challenges, our personal health and family circumstances often could pose challenges um, to our desire to serve. And so, as a woman, as a former member of this House, the Senate, as a former holder of public office, as a person who served our great nation, Trinidad and Tobago, on behalf of the members on this side, I express condolences to the family of Mrs. Donna Carter Hunt, a senator and diplomat. We thank her for her service to Trinidad and Tobago. May her soul rest in eternal peace. Senator Mahabir. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice President. On behalf of the independent bench, I rise to pay tribute to our former colleague, Senator Donna Carter Hunt. Unlike my colleague, Senator Khan, I never met Ms. Senator Hunt, but in reflecting upon her profile and on her life, what I am able to glean is that there is and was an individual who would leave the comfort of a job in the public service, teaching service, and contest a general election. It takes, in my mind, a measure of conviction, fortitude, commitment to a cause for an individual to make that bold step and to take the consequences of losing at the general election because once that is done, it is very difficult to return to one's original place of employ. But her service subsequently to our chamber 
I think is a testimony to the fact that she was someone with a contribution to make not only to her political party, but to the general welfare of Trinidad and Tobago. And that based upon her contribution here, her contribution in the office of the prime minister, we saw her promotion, her elevation to representing Trinidad and Tobago internationally. Internationally in a very unique place, South Africa, as my colleague Senator Khan indicated, at a time when South Africa was in its period of adjustment. I am sure she would have used her experience as a Trinidadian, living as she did in an environment where I've always maintained Trinidad and Tobago is an exemplar country, despite all that can be said against us. It's an exemplar country where we have been able to obtain an accord amongst the various groups who live here and to provide an example to a country like South Africa, which was now beginning to accept the equality of all who lived in that country. Her contribution in representing Trinidad and Tobago is, uh, is something that I think is meritorious. And her life has to be a testimony to not only people but women in general, uh, that once there is a commitment to the cause of public service, one should heed that clarion call. One should fulfill that inner desire, that burning need to engage in public service. And in so doing, not only are you as a person elevated, but the country as a whole benefits. Her life is an inspiration to all who wish to enter public service. It's a testimony that we can serve at all levels. We can serve at the levels of President of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. We can serve at the level of a senator in the Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago. It is all aimed at one goal. That goal is to improve currently and in the future the welfare and the well-being of all the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. To the family of Donna Carter, I say, we, we recognize and we celebrate her life. We express deep con condolences. And there is the greatest of appreciation for what you would have done to the chamber, the Senate, and to the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. May her soul rest in peace. Thank you. Honorable Senators, at this time, I too would like to join in expressing condolences to the family of the former Senator and High Commissioner of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago to the Republic of South Africa, Mrs. Donna Carter Hunt. Mrs. Carter Hunt came to this house as a former teacher and would be remembered for her sterling contribution to the development of the nation's youth. She entered the realm of representative politics and although unsuccessful, still took the opportunity to serve as a member in the seventh Republican Parliament from December 28, 2001 to October the 9th, 2002, when she was appointed as a Minister of State in the Office of the Prime Minister with responsibility for ecclesiastic and inter-religious affairs. Her soft but candid manner was surely a skill that was well developed from her former stomping ground and would have served her tremendously in the diplomatic arena when she was appointed as the High Commissioner to the Republic of South Africa. Mrs. Carter Hunt demitted office in 2008 and moved to Costa Rica until her passing. Her service to country is appreciated, and she now joins the ranks of exemplary citizens that have served and gone. She will be missed. May she rest in peace. Honorable Senators, we will now observe a minute of silence. Honorable Senators, I have instructed the clerk to convert to her family the sentiments expressed today. Honorable Senators, permit me to revert to item three as indicated earlier on the order paper. I have received the following correspondence from the acting president, Christine Kangalo, Her Excellency Christine Kangalo. 
the Constitution of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, by Her Excellency Christine Kanglu, Acting President of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago and Commander in Chief of the Armed Forces, Christine Kangalu, Acting President, to Miss Alicia Romano. Whereas the President of the Senate has temporarily vacated her office of Senator to act as President of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, now therefore I, Christine Kangalu, Acting President as aforesaid, acting in accordance with the advice of the Prime Minister in exercise of the power vested in me by Section 44 of the Constitution of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, do hereby appoint you, Alicia Romano, to be temporarily a member of the Senate with effect from the 16th of January 2018 and continuing during the acting appointment of Senator the Honorable Christine Kangaloo as President of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, given under my hand and the seal of the President of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago at the office of the President, St. Anne's, this 15th day of January 2018. Honorable Senators, Senators required to take the oath. I, Alicia Romano, having been appointed a member of Parliament, do swear by Almighty God that I will bear true faith and allegiance to Trinidad and Tobago, will uphold the Constitution and the law, and will conscientiously and impartially discharge the responsibility to the people of Trinidad and Tobago upon which I am about to enter. Bills brought from the House of Representatives. The miscellaneous provisions, mutual assistance in criminal matters, proceeds of crime, financial intelligence unit of Trinidad and Tobago, customs and exchange control, Bill 2017, in the name of the Attorney General. Attorney General. Vice President, in accordance with Standing Order 621B, I beg to move that the next stage of the bill be taken later in the proceedings. Honorable Senators, the question is that the next stage of the bill be taken later in the proceedings. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The next stage of the bill will be taken later in the proceedings. Petitions, papers. Minister of Rural Development and Local Government. Thank you very much, Mr. <laughs> Vice President. I have the honor to lay on the table the following paper as listed on the order paper in my name. The annual administrative report of the Kuva Talparo, Tabaki Talparo Regional Corporation for fiscal year. October 2014 to September 2015. Thank you very much. Minister of Labor and Small Enterprise Development. Mr. Vice President, I have the honor to lay on the table the following paper as listed on the other paper in my name. The annual report of the recognition 
the Registration, Recognition, and Certification Board for the year 2015. Thank you. Minister in the Ministry of Finance. Mr. Vice President, I have the honor to lay on the table the following papers as listed on the order paper and the supplemental order paper in the name of the Minister of Finance. The report of the Auditor General of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago on the financial statements of the North Central Regional Health Authority for the years ended September 30, 20, 2009, 2010, 2011, 2012, and 2013. <coughs> The report of the Auditor General of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago on the financial statements of the Airports Authority of Trinidad and Tobago for the year ended December 31st, 2013. The annual audited financial statements of the Education Facilities Company Limited for the financial year ended September 30, 2014. The annual report of the Financial Intelligence Unit of Trinidad and Tobago for the year ended September 30, 2017. The audited financial statements of the National Quarries Company Limited for the years ended September 30, 2010 and 2011. The report of the Central Bank of Trinidad and Tobago on the insurance and pensions for the year ended December 31, 2015. The audited financial statements of the Trinidad and Tobago Tourism Business Development Limited for the financial year ended September 31, 2016. The report of the Auditor General of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago on the financial statements of the National Agricultural Marketing and Development Corporation for the year ended September 30, 2008. The report of the Auditor General of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago on the financial statement of the Point Fortin Civic Center for the year ended September 30, 2007. The ministerial response of the Ministry of Finance to the sixth report of the Joint Select Committee on State Enterprises, second session, 2016 to 2017, 11th Parliament, on an inquiry into the borrowing practices of state enterprises with an emphasis on regulation of borrowing proposes purposes for borrowed funds and sustainability of debt servicing ratios. The ministerial response of the Ministry of Finance to the fifth report of the Joint Select Committee on State Enterprises, second session, 2016 to 2017, 11th Parliament, on an inquiry into the administration and operations of Caribbean Airlines Limited. The consolidated audited financial statements of the First Citizens Holdings Limited for the financial year ended September 30, 2016, and the unconsolidated annual audited financial statements of Lake Asphalt of Trinidad and Tobago Limited for the financial years ended September 30, 2011, 2012, and 2013. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Minister of Works and Transport. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Mr. Vice President, I have the honor to lay on the table the following paper as listed on the other paper in my name. The ministerial response of the Ministry of Works and Transport to, to the eighth report of the Public Accounts Committee, second session, 2016, 2017, 11th Parliament, on the examination of the report of the Auditor General of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago on a special audit of the Public Transport Service Corporation and the annual report of the Trinidad and Tobago Civil Aviation Authority for year ending 2016. Thank you. Attorney General. Mr. Vice President, I have the honor to lay on the table the following papers as listed on the order paper in my name. The Freedom of Information Exemption Order 2017 and the annual report of the Legal Aid and Advisory Authority for the year 2013 2012 to 2013. Leader of Government Business. Minister of Agriculture. Minister of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries. Mr. Vice President, I have the honor to lay on the table the following papers listed on the other paper in my name. The ministerial response of the Ministry of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries to the second report of the Joint Select Committee on Land and Physical Infrastructure Second session 2016 2017, 11th Parliament on an inquiry into the allocation and utilization of state lands for food production. Thank you. Leader of Government Business. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. <clears throat> 
Mr. So Vice President, I have the honor to lay on the table the following papers as listed on the order paper. In the name of the Vice President, the Minister of Housing and Urban Development, the Minister of Community Development, Quality and the Arts, <clears throat> and the Minister of Public Administration and Communication, the Minister of National Security, the Minister of Sport and Youth Affairs, <clears throat> and in my own name. The 39th Annual Report of the Ombudsman for the year 2016, the Ministerial Response of the Ministry of Housing and Urban Development to the Fifth Report of the Public Administration and Appropriations Committee, Second Session 2016-2017, <clears throat> 11 Parliament, on an examination into the Ministry of Housing and Urban Development with specific reference to accountability and transparency, <clears throat> inventory control, internal audit, subhead 02, goods and services, subhead 03, minor equipment purchases, subhead 09, development program, <clears throat> consolidated fund and infrastructure development fund. The Trinidad and Tobago Housing Development Corporation vesting amendment to the first schedule Number six, order 2017, additional information relating to the administrative report of the former Ministry of the Arts and Multiculturalism for the period 2014-2015, <clears throat> the annual report of the National Library and Information Systems Authority, NALIS, for fiscal year 2015-2016, <clears throat> the annual report of the Public Service Commission for the year 2016, the ministerial response of the Ministry of National Security to the fifth report of the Joint Select Committee on Human Rights, Equality and Diversity, second session 2016-2017, 11 Parliament, <clears throat> on the examination of the human rights of remandees at remand yard at remand prison, <clears throat> the ministerial response of the Ministry of Sports and Youth Affairs to the second report of the Public Accounts Enterprise Committee, second session 2016-2017, 11 Parliament, on the examination of the report of the Auditor General of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago on a special audit of the operations of the Sports Company of Trinidad and Tobago with particular reference to the development and upgrading of <coughs> sporting facilities in Trinidad. And finally, the Petroleum Amendment Regulations 2017. Reports from committees. Senator Obika. Mr. Vice President, I have the honor to present the following reports as listed on the order paper in my name. The 10th report of the Public Accounts Committee, Second Session, 2016-2017, 11th Parliament on the examination of the audited financial statements of the Eastern Region Health Authority for the financial years 2008-2013. The 11th report of the Public Accounts Committee, Second Session, 2016-2017, 11th Parliament on the examination of the audited financial statements of the Land Settlement Agency for the financial years 2008 and 2009. The 12th Report of the Public Accounts Committee, Second Session, 2016-2017, 11th Parliament on the examination of the report of the Auditor General on the Public Accounts of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago for the financial year 2016, with specific reference to the Auditor General's Department. The 13th Report of the Public Accounts Committee, Second Session, 2016-2017, 11th Parliament on the examination of the report of the Auditor General on the Public Accounts of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago for the financial year 2016, with specific reference to the Ministry of <coughs> Finance. The 14th report of the Public Accounts Committee, Second Session, 2016-2017, 11th Parliament on the examination of the report of the Auditor General on the Public Accounts of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago for the financial year 2016, with specific reference to the Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries. Senator Mark. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Mr. Vice President, I have the honor to present the following reports as listed on the order paper in my name. The seventh report of the Public Administration and Appropriations Committee Second session, 2016-2017, 11th Parliament, on the examination into the Ministry of Sport and Youth Affairs with specific reference to follow up to the first report of the Public Administration and Appropriations Committee and current expenditure related to official 
travel to Tobago. And the eighth report of the Public Administration and Appropriations Committee, second session, 2016-2017, 11th Parliament, on the examination into the Ministry of Education with specific reference to inventory control, internal audit, subhead 02, goods and services, subhead 03, minor equipment purchases, subhead 04, current transfers and subsidies, subhead 09, development program, consolidated fund, and infrastructure development fund. Urgent questions. Senator Mark. Right, uh, Mr. Vice President, the Honorable Minister of Education. Can the minister indicate what urgent measures are being implemented to ensure the timely completion of the works being done on the Ramai Trace Hindu School. Honorable Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice President. The construction works at Ramai Trace SDMS Primary School were terminated by the contractor because the Ministry of Education was unable to make payments that were due. Through the EFCL, the Ministry was able to get the contractor to rescind his termination and confirm his willingness to re-engage with the project. Further, the Ministry has since made part payment to the contractor and is awaiting a release of funds from the Ministry of Finance in order to make additional payments. Once the outstanding monies are paid, the contractor will resume work and complete the construction of the school. The construction works are 83% complete. Thank you very much. Senator Mark. Yes. Can I ask the Honorable Minister, um, in light of that response, could you advise this Honorable House um, of a possible time frame for the completion of payments to the contractor so that he can resume fully his job to complete the school, as you claim, that is 85% completed at this time. Honorable Minister of Education. Mr. Vice President, as much as I would like to give a date at this point, I'm unable to give a date for the completion of works. Senator Mark. So, Mr. Vice President, um, is the minister aware that it is approximately between two or three years now that that school has been under construction and some 271 students have been housed in a temporary Hindu temple. And would he not agree with me that efforts must be taken to speed up this arrangement so that the students can have their school completed and they can resume classes under decent conditions? Honorable Minister of Education. Mr. Vice President, I already indicated that we at the Ministry of Education will be doing everything possible to ensure the completion of that school is done as soon as possible. In terms of the exact date, as I said before, I am not in a position to give that at this time. Questions on notice. Mr. Vice President, I crave your indulgence to indicate <clears throat> that the government is pleased to announce that it will be answering all questions listed on the order. Please. Senator Mark. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Question number 10 to the Honorable Minister of Energy and Energy Industries. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Mr. Vice President, response to question number 10. Petrotrin has advised that to its knowledge, 
it is not aware of any Petrotrin owned facilities or equipment that has been located on the compound of ANV at San Francisco Penal, which is not in the Catsill field. As a consequence, and unless there's evidence to suggest otherwise, no action is presently being contemplated. Mark. Question number 11 to the Honorable Minister of Energy and Energy Industries. Honorable Minister of Energy and Energy Industries. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Once again, in answer to question number 11, Petrotrin has advised that Mr. Dev Singh was appointed custody transfer officer through due process as inscribed, as inscribed in its collective agreement. And based on his experience, which included nine years prior working experience in the oil transfer section, which was ultimately renamed the custody transfer system, so the custody transfer department, which means he had nine years experience in working in that section. Senator Mark. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Could the Honorable Minister indicate to this House precisely when was Mr. Diyoki Singh um, appointed to this particular position of custody transfer officer at Petrotrain. Honorable Minister of Energy and Energy Industry. Yeah. Mr. Vice President, I don't have the specific date, but it, is, it's, it shouldn't be a problem to actually get the exact date of his engagement in the custody transfer section. Senator Mark. Vice President, is the, uh, is the Minister aware that Mr. Diyoki Singh was in fact initially employed at Petrotrain as a hospitality officer before being transferred into that particular position. Are you aware of this? Honorable Minister of Energy and Energy Industry. Mr. Vice President, Mr. Deuki Singh's last position before he was reassigned to the custody transfer section was as an hospitality officer. But prior to that, he worked in the oil transfer section which was, in fact, renamed afterwards the custody transfer section. Senator Mark. Could the Honorable Minister indicate this House, and could he share with this House what particular process was involved in this gentleman being transferred or being promoted from being an ordinary hospitality officer to this very important position called custody transfer officer? Could you share with the Senate the process. Honorable Minister of Energy and Energy Industries. <clears throat> Mr. Vice President, Petrotrin's collective agreement <coughs> with the Oil Field Workers Trade Union is some, has some of the most involved procedural guidelines for taking any single action. Even promotions and transfer goes through a robust process that is jointly administered and supervised by both the union and the management. <coughs> transfers, when transfers or when um, vacancies arise, first you have to look within your section. If it cannot be found within your section, then you go company-wide to see if there's any appropriate person. And then if not, well, then you advertise externally. <coughs> My understanding is these processes were, were observed both um, in compliance with the collective agreement and it showed up Mr. David Kissing's name. Uh, Senator Mark. Mr. Vi uh, Mr. Vice President, is the Minister aware that Mr. Dioki Singh was parachuted into this position? And Mr. Dioki Singh, having been parachuted into the position, was strategically placed there to facilitate the fake oil scandal that took place in the country. Are you aware of that? Senator Mark, I will not allow that question. Next question on the order paper. And you have exhausted my four? Yes, you have exhausted oh. all four. Next question, oh, please. Have one for him. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Vice President. Yeah, this one is directed to my honorable friend from Point Forte. To the Honorable Minister of National Security, question number 12. Honorable Minister of National Security. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice President. Mr. Vice President, the government of Trinidad and Tobago recognizes its duty to treat with a wide range 
of unacceptable activity that may cause harm to individuals, communities, and to the environment. In this regard, Mr. Vice President, law enforcement and safety officials can give the assurance that incidents of antisocial behavior in all its forms will be treated with the appropriate level of importance. In particular, the Trinidad Police Service can assure the public that once unlawful activities are reported, they will be thoroughly investigated and, where necessary, perpetrators will be dealt with in accordance with the law, Mr. Vice President. Senator Mark. Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice President. Mr. Vice President, can I ask the Honorable Minister, um, since this incident involving its media worker or journalist, has the authorities, the police, taken steps to ensure that other media workers who may wish to tra traverse that area are, in fact, being be able to do so or are being able to do so without being molested by elements of this company that use brute force to damage the journalists at that time. Could you give this house the assurance that action and measures have been taken to alert that particular owner that that road does not belong to him, it's a public road, and any citizen of this country can traverse that road. Have you taken action in that regard, sir? Honorable Minister of National Security. Mr. Vice President, I'm not quite sure which one of the questions I should answer. I, there, there are several questions that were thrown at me. I'm not quite sure which one you want me to answer. Philip, can, you, can I please ask for some clarification, please, Mr. Vice President? Senator Mark? You, Senator Mark, hold on. Yes, sir. Rephrase the question in neater fashion. I just ask him one, sir. Could you kindly inform this house what action, if any, you have taken or the authorities have taken under your control to ensure that journalists are able to traverse that road and or the public without being molested by those persons who are owners of ANV oil and gas. Honorable Minister of National Security. Mr. Vice President, the Trinidad Police Service controls and looks after all the roads in Trinidad and Tobago with respect to law enforcement and will continue regardless of where the road is throughout Trinidad and Tobago, Mr. Vice President. Mr. Mr. Vice President, uh, Mr. Vice President, having regard to the fact that this road is a special road, almost like a fortress road, the question that is being asked, having regard to the experience, the experience of the journalists and journalists and even members of the public, can you give the country the assurance that they can now traverse that road without let or hindrance or being brutalized by the owners of that property? Could you, could you tell us? Could you tell us? Could you give us some? Could you give us some assurance, sir? Mr. Vice President? Can I get some assurance, sir? So I can go. I want to go. I will not allow that question. Next question. I have exhausted my question, sir. Can I go on, sir? Senator Richards, he has the next question okay. on the order paper. Mr. Vice President, the order paper with that question before me. Thank you. Question number 39 to the Minister of Public Administration and Communication. Minister of Public Administration and Communications. Mr. Vice President. Mr. Vice President, I'm pleased to respond to the question posed to the Minister of Public Administration and Communications. Mr. Vice President, the draft broadcasting code is expected to be brought to Parliament within the first quarter of the calendar year 2018. Amendments to the Telecommunications Act must be effected before the code can be laid. As such, Mr. Vice President, the code is expected to be laid in Parliament subsequently or substantially contemporaneously with the effecting of the amendments to the Act. In response to part two of the question, Mr. Vice President, as presently conceived and drafted, the draft broadcasting code does not contemplate within its objectives of scope the mandating of local content in the airplay of commercial owners and or operators. 
The government has established an interagency task force to address the matter of local content on which the Telecommunications Authority of Trinidad and Tobago has representation. Consideration is still underway whether re the requirements, if any, for local content will be placed within a separate framework or within the existing draft broadcast code. In response to the third part of the question, Mr. Vice President, at this time there is no final percentage contemplated as the matter of local content is still under consideration. I thank you. Senator Richards. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Uh, would the minister be able to indicate if, when the draft code is, is completed, it will include provisions for state media in the context of broadcasting in Trinidad and Tobago? Honorable Minister, Agriculture, Land and Fisheries. Mr. Vice President, the expectation is that the broadcast code would bind everyone in the media, including the state. Senator Richards. Would, would the court also take into consideration the issue of the internet and its impact on uh, evolving broadcast provisions? Honorable Minister of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries. Vice President, the simple answer is yes. Senator Richards. That's it for that, for that question. So. You have no more supplementals? Okay. Senator Mark. Question number 39 on behalf. 40. 40. Oh, question number 40, sir. I beg your pardon. Um, question number 40 on behalf of Senator Saddam Hussein to the Honorable Minister of Works and Transport. Honorable Minister of Works and Transport. Thank you. Mr. Vice President. Mr. Vice President, the idea of a port in Toko to establish a ferry link between Tobago and the northeast of Trinidad was conceived from as early as 1987 with a project formulated report entitled Sea Bridge Across the Galleon Passage prepared by a consortium of consultants called the Sea Bridge Team. A report was also produced in 1988 by the Institute of Marine Affairs that, uh, that identified Toko Bay as an optional location for a ferry port. The consultant, the Sea Bridge Team, were later engaged by the Industrial Development Corporation to conduct a feasibility study to determine the op optional location and arrangement in Northeast Trinidad for a ferry port, which was completed in 1990. The consultants confirmed the findings of the earlier report produced by the 1988 by the Institute of Marine Affairs. Mr. Vice President, despite the age of this study, the reports are considered to be still generally relevant and applicable, since the same principles of and the demand for intra-island connectivity, economic development, and coastal sea transport surveillances still apply. However, because of the age of this study, the ministry was unable to access information on the cost of this survey. Thank you. Senator Mark. Um, Mr. Vice President, could the Honorable Minister indicate whether the government intends to rely completely and absolutely on those dated reports or whether it is the intention of the government to conduct a feasibility a feasibility study given the current reality that we are faced with. Senator Mark has two questions. So which one you want answered? The first one or the second one? Well, well I can say uh, I, both. <laughs> well, ask the first one first and then the second one second. Rephrase. Rephrase and ask him one question at a time. <laughs> Yes, let, let me pay attention to you, okay, rather than this lady here. 
Um, may I ask again whether it is the intention of the government to rely on those dated reports as the basis for its feasibility study as it seeks to move towards the construction of a port service at Togo. Honorable Minister of and Transport. President, I'll just repeat the last paragraph I read. Despite the age, these studies and reports are considered to be still generally relevant and applicable since the same principles of and demand for intra-island connectivity, economic development, and coastal sea transportation, coastal surveillance still apply. So the government, the, the study is still relevant today. Thank you. Senator Ramdin. For you, Mr. Vice President. I'd just like the Minister of Works and Transport to confirm that the decision of this present government to build a port in, in, in Toku is premised on a report that is 17 years old. 27 years old. You retract the question? Or are you asking it? A report that was conducted in 1987. 30 years. 30 years old that this government has decided to construct a port in, to in Toko based on a report that is 30 years old? I wouldn't allow that question because I think he answered that question already. And Senator Mark would have asked a supplemental question along the same line, so I'm not going to allow that question. Next supplemental question, yes, Senator Mark. The Honorable Minister has, of course, been attached to that particular project, or are you still seeking to determine a cost for that particular project, given what you have as a feasibility study at this time? 41? Are you asking question 41? No, I have to discuss Minister of Works and Transport. Okay. Supplemental question from Senator Mark. Uh, Mr. Vice President. The, the, the question is, is the same question, question 41, so I'll answer, give you the answer of quest, that question. It is expected that the construction for this port will begin in 2019. However, the actual startup date of this project depends on the, the, the Certificate of Environmental Clearance from the EME. However, this project has not been tendered, so the final costs have not been developed. Thank you. Senator Mark, no more supplemental questions? Or do you have another one? No, I want to ask through you, Senator Mr. Mark. Vice President, no cost has been attached to the, to the project. That is what you have indicated. No final cost has been attached. Is there a budgeted cost to that project? Minister of Works and Transport. Mr. Vice President, the project is in the conceptual stage, and a budgeted cost will only uh, be presented after the, the, the Certificate of Environmental Clearance and all additional work on the project. That's the only way you can come up with an actual uh, budgeted cost for the project. No more supplemental questions on that question. Next question, Senator Mark. Question number 41 to the Honorable Minister of Works and Transport. Honorable Minister of Works and Transport. Again, Mr. Vice President, it is expected that the construction of the ferry port will commence in 2019 for a duration of approximately three years. However, the actual startup date for this project is subjected to NITCO's acquiring the required certificate of environmental clearance and other statutory approvals. This project has not yet been tendered. Thank you. Senator Mark, next question. Question number 42 to the Honorable Minister of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries. 
Honourable Minister of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. In response to Part A of the question, to date a Certificate of Environmental Clearance has not been obtained from the Environmental Management Authority for the construction of the Moruga Fishing Port. Prior to issuing a Certificate of Environmental Clearance, the EMA will require an environmental impact assessment to be completed. Substantial work, Mr. Vice President, was done to complete an EIA. While the project was under the then Ministry of Agriculture, Land and Marine Resources in 2005 to 2016. However, in November 2016, the EME advised that given the original terms of reference for the CEC, which was issued in December 2006, it is no longer valid. The EME also advised that the original terms of reference could not be amended to capture changes in legislation and climatic conditions and recommended that a new application be submitted for the CEC. This would allow for changes in scro scope to be analyzed. The contract to complete the EIA, Mr. Vice President, was awarded in October 2016. A new application for the CEC was submitted in February 2017. In response to the second part of the question, Mr. Vice President, to date, the Ministry of Rural Development and Local Government under whom the project falls, has not paid out any money on this project for the sum, from the sum allocated for fiscal 2018. However, Mr. Vice President, unbilled expenses are being incurred <coughs> in relation to the ongoing work on the project. Thank you. Senator Mark. Mr. Vice President, would the Honorable Minister care to share with his house what is the value of those um, funds that have been paid out, as you have just outlined? Honourable Minister of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries. Mr. Vice President, just to repeat, to date the Ministry of Rural Development and Local Government has not paid out any money on this project from the sum allocated for fiscal 2018. However, unbilled expenses are being incurred in relation to the ongoing work on the project. Thank you. Senator Mark. Would you like to share with us the, 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 what are these unbilled works that are going on, and is there an attached value that you will have to meet at some point in time? Honourable Minister. Mr. Vice President, in the normal way a project of this nature unfolds, you'd have contracts, for example, there would have been a contract, as I said previously, contract awarded for the completion of the EIA, and contracts awarded in relation to the CIC, CEC, sorry. And There'd be, there's work that would be performed, but the contractor has not billed for that work. And when the contractor bills for the work, submits the, of, the invoices, it would be paid through the process involving the Ministry of Finance against the allocation for this fiscal year. So it is close to the end of the fiscal year, we would know having received the invoices and having paid out, out of the um, allocation in the PSIP, we would know the actual payments for the project. Thank you. Senator Mark. My colleague again. In terms of the CEC, um, seeing that it was an application was made in February of 2017, I think I heard you say, could you indicate to us what time frame you anticipate the EMA will take before issuing that CEC to the particular agency? Mr. President, as I said in my opening to the, to the response, the CEC would be dependent on the EIA. The EIA contract was awarded in October 2016. Once the EIA has been completed um, to the satisfaction of, of the EMA, then the CEC will proceed um, having, have, on, be on the basis of what is in the EIA. So it's very difficult to say at what stage the EMA. We can bind the EMA to make a decision at a particular time. Thank you. Senator Obika. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Through you, question number 47 to the Minister of Education. Honorable Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice President. The affected classrooms at the Point Fortin Anglican Primary School that were temporarily vacated are now back to full operation following the successful completion of repair works. While the repairs were being carried out, Mr. Vice President, 
those classes were relocated, were relocated to other parts of the school so that there was no loss of teaching time. Thank you. Senator Obika. Could, uh, Mr. Vice President, could the Minister of Education indicate when those repair works were done? Honorable Minister of Education. Mr. Vice President, those repair works were done during the Christmas vacation period. Question number 49, asked by Senator Melissa Ramke, soon will be deferred due to her absence. We'll move on to question number 50, Senator Richards. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Through you, question number 50 to the Honorable Minister of Education. Honorable Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice President. The Ministry of Education is actively pursuing the release of funds to facilitate the payment of outstanding, of outstanding allowances to all of our national scholars. We are optimistic that such outstanding dues will be paid by January 31st, 2018. Thank you. Senator Richards. Is it January 1st, you said? 31st. 31st. 31st, thank you. Minister, through you, Mr. Vice President, could the Minister indicate how many students would have been affected locally and or internationally by this interruption. Honourable Minister. Mr. Vice President, I don't have that, those figures at my disposal, but again, I can provide that to the Honourable Senator. Senator Richards. Thank you, I appreciate that. Can the Minister, because of the uh, economic situation that the country is experiencing, which would no doubt be part of the reason that these issues are occurring, could the Minister indicate if the Ministry is seeking to put uh, measures in place that would mitigate these kinds of interruptions given the uh, psychological duress it places some of these students, particularly those studying abroad, uh, for their uh, assurance, if possible. Senator Richard, I wouldn't allow that question. That's a, another question that would not um, come from the question asked. Do you have another supplemental question? Senator Obika. Question number 52 to the Minister of Education. Honourable Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice President. Mr. Vice President, a total of 72610927 dollars and 74 cents is owed by the Ministry of Education to seven security firms providing security services to schools throughout Trinidad. The responsibility for security of schools in Tobago is vested with the Tobago House of Assembly. Mr. Vice President, the Ministry of Education has processed invoices from security firms to the value of approximately $52 million in the current financial year. And of this amount, actual payments totaling $33 million have already been made. Payment to security firms takes place in an ongoing process as invoices are processed and the releases are obtained from the Ministry of Finance. Thank you. Senator Obika. Uh, to you, um, Mr. Vice President, to you. Also, can the Minister indicate has any of the security firms threatened to withhold services to the schools? Honorable Minister. Mr. Vice President, no such information has come to my knowledge. Senator Obika. Uh, is the Chair Tree, Mr. Vice President, is the Minister aware uh, that one primary school in Point Fourteen in particular, I would not want to call the name because, of course, you have to protect the interests of the teachers and the students there in the event that there is a security lapse. Is he aware that there's a primary school in Point Fourteen that did not have security report for duty in December. Honorable Minister. Mr. Vice President, in December, I don't have that information. That information is not with me. And I'm surprised that that is not being brought forward. Now, a school not having security in December, we are in January. We are in the beginning of a, new, of a new year. You keep quiet. You keep quiet. Senator, any Senator Obika. Uh, 
I would just like to relay that the question didn't arise before, so I could not have asked, I could not have asked it prior. Um, also, um, well, the, the question, by, by presenting the question, I, I would have assumed that you would have made that check. Uh, the other thing I would, the question I would like to ask is, is there a possibility of security being compromised given this $72.6 million being owed to security firms in this current economic time? Honorable Minister. Mr. Vice President, we have been working together with the security firms. In fact, the permanent secretaries recently met with representatives from these security firms, and we have their commitment that they will continue in the national interest and in the interest of education to provide security services to our schools. They are aware, fully aware, of the financial situations, the financial situation that we are confronted with and of our challenges. They have pledged to work with us, and we are doing everything possible to ensure that they are paid. Thank you. Senator Beaker, next question, if you have no more supplementaries. Question number 53 to the Minister of Public Utilities. Minister of Public Utilities. Mr. Vice President, the efforts of the Water and Sewage Authority to recover outstanding money owed by delinquent customers through the sale of properties is a last resort solution to a monumental problem. It is the intention of the authority to consider each matter on a case-by-case -case basis before any property is considered for sale due to outstanding water rates. It must be noted, however, that the Rates and Recov Recovery of Charges Act, Chapter 74, Subsection 3, provides that the, provides that the power of sale, A, shall not be exercised unless and until the rates or charges shall have been in arrears and unpaid for more than three months after the same became due, and B, shall where any sum of money charged on any property is payable by installment be exercisable for the recovery of the whole sum charge or the whole of the outstanding installment whenever any of the installment remains unpaid for more than three months after the date on which the installment was payable. As such, the law does not specify the level of indebtedness. WASA will therefore follow the process for the recovery of, the outstand of outstanding rates and where there has been no success the authority will determine whether to pursue the sale of the property on a case-by-case -case basis. Mr. Vice President, as it pertains to persons who are infirmed or, or disabled, WASA will give consideration in how it exercises the power of sale. The national community, and especially those persons who face challenges with the payment of their water bills are reminded that there are mechanisms in place to provide assistance to qualifying individuals. The Ministry of Public Utilities, through its Utilities Assistance Program, provides assistance with the payment of utility bills to low-income persons, such as pensioners, persons with disabilities, and the beneficiaries of public assistance and the Conditional Cash Transfer Program food card. In addition, WASA offers a payment plan to its customers who have fallen in arrears to pay their water rates. Senator Obika. Uh, Mr. Vice President, through you, could the minister indicate what would be the time frame for eviction or loss of property should an individual decide that they cannot pay. Honorable Minister. Mr. Chair, Mr. Prime, Mr. Vice President, as I outlined, that we are encouraging 
all individuals to come in and set up payment plans and deal with the arrears. And we will be embarking on, or as a last resort, the attempt to, to sell people's property on a case-by-case -case basis, where people fail to avail of situations or seek assistance or seek to come to the authority to deal with their matters, the authority will exercise their rights to recover them among the large sums of money that is outstanding. Senator Ramdeen. President, through you to the Honorable Minister of Public Utilities. Minister, what is the mechanism that the ministry has in place to inform those affected persons? You, you've indicated in your first answer that there are a number of th mechanisms in place to help persons who are in a position of hardship. What mechanism does the ministry have in place to educate those persons or to inform those particular groups of persons that these uh, mechanisms are available to them in order to, um, to alleviate the hardship that they may be suffering? Honorable Minister. Madam Mr. Vice President, all the, all the, the different um, alleviation, poverty alleviation mechanisms are published on the utilities website. They are there, and the utilities have their own internal programs of communication programs and teams that go out from time to time uh, via invitations or by other means that they seem necessary to go to make presentations to different groups um, to let people know about these particular programs. Um, I think there is also, when these programs were launched, there were appropriate communication tools that were used to also let everyone be aware that these programs exist. Senator Obika. Uh, thanks, Mr. Vice President. Through you. Water is a, is, a, is a human right, in my opinion. And if persons are owing for lack of being able to afford $75 TT a month, and they can't access a website for internet. They may not have been around when um, they could have been looking for money to feed their family when these groups were being... Senator, are you asking a question? Are you making a statement? I would like to, I would like to ask uh, what further mechanisms besides the website and these groups, they will, they will give these persons some time to address the situation in terms of giving them the information beyond advertising on the internet and beyond a group, what, what other Sen mechanisms? Senator, it's, it's, it's a little difficult for me to even follow you because you've given a, a, quite a long preamble. Could you just rephrase, rephrase and summarize what it is you're trying to say? Ask it, ask it in terms of a question so that I can understand and I'm sure other senators can understand what is the question that you're asking. Thank you again, uh, Mr. Vice President. Most of the persons who may not be able to afford to pay a water bill would be poor persons. So therefore, the question that I'm asking is, how beyond the website and the groups, how are you going to get the information to these persons to know what are the solutions that are available to them to pay their water rates? Mr. Madam Vice, M Mr. Vice President, um, as you are aware, when it, when, the when it has reached to the position of selling or taking a position to sell someone's property, there's, therefore that takes it to another realm of advertisements that is, pres that is done before one exercises that particular right. So at that particular stage, and there are a number of times, as has happened presently, when the advertisement is there and people recognize that that is happening, a lot of individuals have come in and WASA has also engaged in negotiations with these individuals and put them on turn payments. During those times when people, so therefore, there are adequate positions that are available for before a property is actually sold where adequate pieces of information is also sent out to all, aware that this is going to, this is something that is also in place. Additionally, as you're saying, 
There's a number of different play, there are a number of different mechanisms and there are a number of different programs in place. Should there should any particular person have a problem that they could attend, they could go to Wasser. There's a Wasser have been encouraging and inviting people to come to the offices to put plans in place. The reality is, Mr. Vice President, is that the authority has over $600 million worth of money that is outstanding. The authority is in dire financial positions. And I also want to make the point that water in Trinidad and Tobago is probably the cheapest in the world. Senator Obika, one more question. Uh, Mr. Vice President, uh, permit me to ask the question that given the minister indicated that water in Trinidad and Tobago is among the cheapest in the world, are there plans to increase water rates or advise of an increase in water rates? Honorable Minister. Mr. Mr. Vice President, and I like to put, uh, I will answer that question again, as I've said a number, of new, a number of times before, the purview of increasing water rates is not that of the minister. There is a RIC, um, the Re a regulatory regulation industries commission that is presently conducting a review of the of the water rates and which will or that that process entails a lot of consultations and that is being done by the RIC the authority that has the responsibility for that particular for regulating tariff increase in the country i am therefore not in a position to see whether there will be or will not be an increase Requests for leave to move the adjournment of the Senate on definite matters of urgent public importance. Senator Mark. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Vice President. Mr. Vice President, I hereby seek leave to move the adjournment of the House today under Standing Order 17 for the purpose of discussing a definite matter of urgent public importance, namely the continuous failure of the government to address the escalating and uncontrollable wave of murders in Trinidad and Tobago. The matter is definite because it pertains specifically to the failure of the Minister of National Security and by extension, the government to address the rapid escalation and the unprecedented increase in the number of murders in Trinidad and Tobago. The matter is urgent because we are only 16 days into the year, and already there have been some 28 confirmed murders, which is a clear indication of the government's continuous failure to address the rampant, violent crimes throughout the country. The matter is of public importance because the state of murders in Trinidad and Tobago have been causing widespread fear and distress to the citizens. It is felt that citizens are under attack by criminal elements. Therefore, people cannot enjoy a sense of comfort in their homes, and this country won't be free of the criminal elements until the government get a hold on crime. Mr. Vice President, I so move. Honorable Senators, I have considered the motion of the Senator, and I am not satisfied that this matter as presented qualifies under the standing order.
public business, private members business, motions. Senator Mark. Thank you very much. Mr. Vice President, I beg to move the following motion standing in my name. Whereas it is provided by Section 5.1c of the Freedom of Information Act, Chapter 2202, that the President may by order exempt public authorities from the application of the Act, and whereas the Freedom of Information Exemption Order 2017 was published on December 14, 2017, by legal notice number 151, and whereas this order seeks to exempt the Strategic Services Agency from the application of the Freedom of Information Act, and whereas the proposed exemption will remove access to information by citizens, interest groups, and the media, all of whom have an interest in the policies, rules, and practices of the Strategic Services agency inter alia, and whereas this order will directly affect the transparency, openness, accountability, and the necessary checks and balances on all aspects of the operations of the Strategic Services Agency to avoid any potential misuse of office and or abuse of power, be it resolved that the Freedom of Information Exemption Order 2017 be annulled. Mr. Vice President, the arrogance of power knows no bounds of decency. And the seduction of power has no limits to its audacity. I want to say from the very outset that this order represents a dark blot on our society. Mr. Vi Mr. Vice President, I will attempt in my time allotted to show how this order, which appeared like a thief in the night, because it came just about when we had left here on the 12th of December, and the other place met on the 15th, it was stable then, and we are now meeting for the first time since that last day we met. I will want to demonstrate how this order represents an assault on the rights and freedoms of the people to the right of expression and freedom of thought. I will further show, Mr. Vice President, how this is a direct attack and assault on the freedom of the press in Trinidad and Tobago. I will also demonstrate, Mr. Vice President, how this is a denial of the people's right to what is called the discovery right. I will further demonstrate, Mr. Vice President, where this motion, this order is a denial of people's access to justice 
and thereby undermining the officers of the court and the court by extension. And Mr. Vice President, in doing all of these things, I will bring to your attention what I would like to describe as the attempt by the government to run a secret service, a PNM private secret service, a service similar to SS Gestapo under Nazi Hitler Germany. I will Mr. demonstrate, Vice Mr. Vice President, standing Mr. Order. Vice President. 46 4, please. I don't understand how four from here. You are Gestapo? What? Senator Mark, what? please. No, no. Yeah, well, I don't know what, what this is about. I've now started. Please retract your statement and apologize. The last statement you just made. Please retract it. You have no started? Last statement that you just made in relation to the Honorable Attorney General, please retract the statement and that apologize. Is that please what is wrong? retract. So you want me to retract that? Okay, I retract it, sir. And it's apologize. No, once you want to retract it, you'll have to apologize. Senator What's Mark? Uh, Senator Mark. I retract, sir. I retract. I retract, sir. I withdraw. On the point of order raised, Senator Mark, be extremely careful with your contribution in this house. Please be reminded of where you are. Continue. I am arguing, Mr. Vice President, that I will demonstrate. I have not even begun to demonstrate my arguments. And the government is jumpy because there are dark intentions on the part of this government to undermine the rights and freedoms of the people Mr. of President, the Republic Mr. of Trinidad and Tobago. I rise in standing President. order 46.6. Senator Mark, this is a final warning. Final warning forward. on the point of order raised. Final warning, be very careful how you move forward with your contribution. Continue. I will demonstrate in my contribution how this government is attempting through this exemption order to undermine from my perspective, Mr. Vice President, and I'm entitled to my opinion, Mr. Vice President, I'm not shouting at anybody. I'm sorry if I showed it at the president. Mr. Vice President, it is my opinion that this order is nefarious. No, you cannot talk to me. Get out of this chair. Senator, Senator, Mark, Senator Mark, take your seat. Take your seat. Honorable members, I will suspend this house for 10 minutes to allow members to regain their decorum and remember where they are. This house now stands suspended for 15 minutes.